All right, hello everybody. Um, my, well, I would say what my, the title of my paper is, but he did it for me. So away we go. Um, the title has a bunch of jargon in it, so I'm gonna have a two-fold background section to sort of unpack what all that jargon means. I'll start with some background on stateless model checking, and we'll begin with an example. This is a simple concurrent program between two threads, um, each of which is doing an access to some shared state in the global variable x. And they're synchronizing their accesses to x in different ways. Thread one by using a mutex, thread two by using an atomic xad instruction. Um, and of course, this being a talk about finding concurrency bugs, you might imagine that this program has a concurrency bug. It does, which can be exposed if you interleave the two accesses of thread x between the two instructions in thread one that the single event x plus plus compiles to, a load of a temporary variable and a store with an addition later. And this can lead to the assertion in thread two failing as the ultimate value of x will be one. Now, as any uh, first sentence of any related work paper in this field will tell you, concurrency bugs are notoriously difficult to find and reproduce. So stateless model checking is a way of uh, attempting to make this problem a little bit less painful. It's a dynamic concurrency testing technique um, in which the, t the test framework controls the thread scheduling as it's executing the test. Um, it repeatedly executes the test on each iteration, uh, leveraging its control over the thread scheduling to enforce a different interleaving to run, with the goal of exhaustively checking all possible program behaviors. Now, as I read out that last bullet point, you should have some red flags popping up in your mind and a picture that looks something like this. Indeed, it's an exponentially sized problem and all possible thread interleavings may be uh, somewhat difficult to achieve. Uh, while for small tests, it's possible to reach the end of the state spaces and provide a total verification of all behaviors, larger tests um, have exponentially many schedules which can uh, result in the state space being way too large to complete in any reasonable CPU budget. And achieving that completion depends on, how, uh, on the size of the state space that results. So let's look at what a state space might look like in pictorial form. Uh, here I've drawn what I call an execution tree. Um, in this tree, each node represents an intermediate execution state of the program. Uh, time flows downwards along the branches, and each edge represents uh, state transitions of the program which arise from executing a thread from one state to the next. Um, I've also color-coded the nodes in the tree um, according to which synchronization event in the example program uh, they correspond to, the mutex lock, the unlock, or the yield call. Now, where I chose to draw those preemption points, um, as I will call them, um, is a problem unto itself. Um, I didn't choose to draw a tree which included an intermediate state on every single instruction of the program, um, otherwise it would not have fit on the slide. So the burning question of stateless model checking is which preemption points are important to test. Um, and the key takeaway uh, from this example that I want you to remember if you remember nothing else is that the state space of interleavings is parameterized by which preemption points you choose. If you choose too, free, too few preemption points to construct your state space, many bugs will go undetected because it will not be capable of exposing the necessary thread interleaving to expose the bugs. On the other hand, if you choose a preemption point on every single instruction, uh, the state space will be enormous and completion of your test will be infeasible. Now, the approach of prior model checkers is to hard code a fixed set of preemption points, committing to one state space in advance of the test, and then using various techniques to cope with the exponential explosion that results. Uh, this list of coping techniques is by no means a comprehensive related work list, but it's the list of three key concepts that I'll build on in the rest of this talk. The first one is called dynamic partial error reduction, which was mentioned in the previous talk. It's a reduction algorithm for, for identifying independent transitions of threads, which can commute without affecting program behavior, and it prunes them so it doesn't need to execute the program according to those. Iterative context bounding um, is a heuristic search ordering strategy based on the insight that most concurrency bugs require a small number of preemptions to expose at a minimum, and it orders the search to prioritize interleaving with fewer preemptions first. Finally, state space estimation is a technique for guessing the size that a state space will ultimately end up being based on the observed structure of the execution tree, um, which you've already observed in some degree of progress you've already achieved. However, even with all of these techniques, 
this fixed preemption point strategy uh, has some problems. Um, the resulting state space can be inappropriate in either direction, um, and you don't necessarily know in advance. Uh, choosing your preemption points statically can make your test infeasibly large, or it can make it insufficient to find bugs, or p possibly even both. Uh, furthermore, even small changes to your code when a stateless model checking uh, test previously could have completed very quickly can result in a change in the state space of, uh, of uh, drastic size and leave you with a test uh, that's impossible to complete in time, even if you made a very small change to your code. So the problem is to make this trade-off decision automatically at runtime on how which preemption points to choose. Okay, uh, now on to the second part of the uh, background section, data race analysis. Um, I'm sure many of you know this definition by heart, but just in case, I'll repeat it briefly. A data race is a pair of memory accesses between two threads where at least one of the accesses is a write. Uh, they're to the same address, of course. The threads do not hold the same lock protecting the access, and there's no happens before relation between the threads. Uh, let me unpack what I mean by happens before relation. In this talk, I'll actually explore two definitions, um, and I'll evaluate them against each other. The first definition I will call pure happens before, um, and this is the Leslie Lamport distributed system um, definition that many of you are probably familiar with. Any synchronization events between two threads establishes a happens before um, establishes a happens before relation between uh, the events before and after. Um, the other definition, called limited happens before, relaxes the requirement on synchronization events such that it requires those synchronization events to actually enforce that one thread must run before the other thread um, for there to be a limited happens before relation. For example, a use of cond wait and cond signal. Um, just to explore the difference between these two relations, I'm gonna provide a brief example. Here's another simple program uh, in which the threads access X unprotectedly, um, and they also have some mutex protected critical section. In the first half of the example, I assume that the critical section is unrelated to uh, whether or not the threads access X. Under pure happens before, uh, the, use of the, same, uh, the use of mutex lock and unlock on the same mutex establishes that there's a happens before relation and there's no data race. Um, however, limited happens before sees that the threads could be reordered and if they were reordered, the X plus pluses would be concurrent with each other. And it identifies what I call a potential, da uh, potential data race. Um, and in this case, it's a true potential data race. That is, if you reorder the threads, there will be a data race. On the other hand, if I edit the critical sections to include some state uh, such as a Boolean flag of Y, which controls whether or not thread two is allowed to access X, pure happens before will still say there's no race here, and it's correct this time, because under limited happens before, you can reorder the threads, but if you do, the second access will go away. And this I call a false positive. Okay, uh, now that we understand the difference between pure and limited happens before relation, um, let's go into a, a bit of philosophy about bugs. Now, not all data races lead to observable failures of a program. Um, there are two sort of philosophical camps on this uh, issue. First, the C++ spe specification um, says all data races are bad and they can lead to undefined behavior. Um, on the other hand, many prior debugging tools recognize that if a data race does not lead to a failure, um, it's not necessarily good to uh, consume some user attention by reporting it. There may be too many data races and the user is only interested in the ones that cause failure. So we don't want to jeopardize the user's willingness to use our tool by flooding them with false positives. Um, so in this work, we focus on concrete observable failures. When I say bugs, that's what I mean. Uh, for example, assertion failures, heap errors, uh, seg fault crashes, infinite loop deadlocks, and so on. So the problem, another problem we'll be tackling in this work is to classify these data races as failing or benign. Going back to our initial example, uh, with the two threads accessing X with the mutex and some atomics, um, we see that when I drew the state space, I did not actually include any preemption points on the, the data racing instruction. Uh, so the resulting state space that I drew here doesn't actually expose the bug. To find that bug, we need what I'll call a data race preemption point. And this leads me into our contribution. Just to uh, lead off with one jargon-filled sentence, just to give an overview of what I'll do. Um, our contribution is an algorithm I call iterative deepening. 
in which we seed a model checker with synchronization preemption points that we can figure out statically, dynamically detecting new data race candidates as the stateless model checker goes on, adding preemption points on those data race candidates one by one as they're discovered, iteratively advancing to new uh, state spaces and preemption points um, uh, that result from these data race candidates, prioritizing the state spaces based on state space estimation until the a specified fixed CPU budget is exhausted. Now, uh, let me uh, give you a bit of a visualization of what I mean by all this. Um, here's a brief picture um, of what might happen in one or two steps of iterative deepening. First, we'll start with what I call a minimal state space. And this is the state space that arises when we put preemption points only on mandatory thread switches. Being a concurrent program, there may be some thread switches which are necessary for correct execution of the program at all. For example, on yields, conways, and so on. Now, adding different preemption points in different combinations, for example, on the left, I've added a mutex lock preemption point. On the right, I've added a mutex unlock one. Um, can produce state spaces which may be of different sizes. Um, on this slide, they are not of different sizes, but you could imagine that they would be. Uh, so we test these in parallel to sort of hedge our bets. Uh, and we use state space estimation to prioritize which one is going to be most fruitful. If these different state spaces are both achievable within the time limit, we'll then combine the preemption points to produce one big state space, uh, which I call the maximal state space. Um, that is, when you have all statically known preemption points uh, enabled, um, this is actually the state space that prior work model checkers commit to testing in advance. Um, but furthermore, uh, if we have some data race preemption points, we can add them as well. And the definition of the maximal state space will change uh, to include the, uh, all preemption points that we've discovered, both synchronization and data races enabled. So some notes about our implementation. We've chosen landslide as our simulator-based model checker. Um, uh, it's based on uh, the Simic simulator, and it targets Pebble thread libraries, which students implement in the high-level undergraduate operating systems class at CMU, and Pintos kernels, uh, which the same, but for Berkeley and University of Chicago, and many other schools as well. Uh, Simix provides instruction and memory level tracing, which Landslide uses to implement dynamic partial load reduction and its data race analysis. Um, Landslide features DPOR, state space estimation, iterative context bounding, data race detection. Um, for the purposes of iterative deepening, we don't actually employ iterative context bounding, but we do employ it in our evaluation uh, to implement a comparison against the state of the art. Quicksand, then, is our implementation of the iterative deepening algorithm. It's a wrapper program which manages the execution of multiple landslide instances with different preemption point combinations. Each of these we refer to as a job. And it prioritizes them at runtime uh, according to the state space estimations that landslide reports. So uh, here's, here's a picture to take a brief tour of our system architecture. Up here in the top left, I've drawn a single instance of landslide, which is exploring some state space with mutex lock and unlock preemption points. It encounters some data race between thread one and thread two at certain lines. And it's actually running within the context of quicksand, which has a dedicated thread for communicating with it. So it will report the data race to quicksand, which will then take the data race, create new preemption points based on the instructions reported, and create new instances of landslide with different combinations of preemption points, one for each of the lines of the data race uh, involved in the data race. And also, as a heuristic, not only do we combine the data race preemption point with the existing preemption points we use to find it, but we'll also test the data race preemption point on its own, uh, just in combination with the mandatory minimal state space uh, that I mentioned previously. Um, this heuristic is based on the insight that sometimes the data race preemption point um, can be encountered immediately, and just one preemption on that data race will find a bug very quickly. But on the other hand, those preemption points we use to find the data race candidate in, uh, to begin with might be necessary to expose the data race behavior at all. So we test it both ways. Now, iterative deepening affor affords some opportunity for reductions across state spaces, kind of analogous to how DPOR and MCR achieve reduction within a state space. And these reductions are based on comparing jobs based on the subset relation between their sets of preemption points. Um, for example, if we're testing a small job and we have a superset job of it deferred for later exploration, 
but that small job reports an ETA way beyond our CPU budget. We can then say, okay, well that bigger job, we're not even going to bother because it's guaranteed to have a superset of interleavings and take as, at least as long. On the other hand, uh, flip side of the coin, if we test a large state space and we find uh, we that we reach the end of it without finding a bug, that allows us to prune the subset state space, which may not have completed yet, uh, because the subset state space is guaranteed to have at most all of the interleavings that we already tested. So we know, of course, that it won't find the same bug. Uh, it won't find any bugs in the same way. Finally, um, the other neat achievement of iterative deepening is a theorem that I call convergence, which is the property that when we test the maximal state space, which we've wound up with after saturating our set of data race preemption points. We've detected all the data races there are to be detected, we've added preemption points on them, and we've reached the end of that maximal state space, which is sometimes possible for small tests. Testing that state space is equivalent to the verification we would have gotten if we decided to preempt on every instruction of the program to begin with. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of the proof, you can read the paper for that of course, but the insight of the proof is that for any arbitrary in buggy interleaving you could give me, I can come up with an equivalent interleaving, which will expose the same bug, which only preempts on synchronization and data races, which iterative deepening is guaranteed to encounter. Hence, iterative deepening provides what I'll call the best of both worlds. For small state spaces, we provide a verification guarantee just as strong as the strongest possible fixed preemption point strategy you could choose. For large state spaces, uh, we fall back to some heuristics which allow us to find bugs very quickly when completion is infeasible. Now these best of both worlds claims of course require some evaluation to back them up, so here you go. Um, there are two two-fold evaluation questions that I'm going to answer. Um, we compare it to single state space uh, um, stateless model checking, which I'll abbreviate on the rest of the evaluation slides. Uh, two questions, one, do we find more bugs given a fixed CPU budget? And two, do we provide more total verification? Again, provided a fixed CPU budget. For each of, each of these questions, I'm going to compare a quicksand against two different uh, single state space testing strategies. One, if we choose to preempt only on synchronization APIs, and two, if we choose to preempt everywhere, that is to say, on every single shared memory access between threads, which in principle includes all, all data races that quicksand could find. So, our experimental setup, our test suite, is compri uh, comprised of operating systems projects submitted by students at CMU Berkeley and the University of Chicago. Um, I have 79 Pebbles thread libraries. The name landslide, by the way, is a pun on the name Pebbles. Um, for each of these, I have six test cases to uh, test different functionality of the thread libraries, and 78 Pintos kernels uh, generously supplied from Berkeley and the University of Chicago. For each of these, I have three test cases to test different functionalities. Um, for each of these tests, I'm running four experimental trials, two of quicksand, one for each of the happens before strategies that I mentioned in the background section, and two uh, single state space control experiments, one for each of the preemption strategies I mentioned on the previous slide. And a bit of back of the envelope math will tell you that uh, uh, for all of these multiplied together, in the graphs you're about to see um, data that represents over a thousand CPU days of testing for each. So here's the first graph. Uh, this graph represents how many bugs we found. Um, what we're looking at here on the x-axis is time elapsed across uh, each individual test case. And I've plotted it on a logarithmic scale to magnify the detail for uh, shortly running tests. On the y-axis is a cumulative distribution of how many tests in our test suite found bugs. Um, so the two blue lines represent the two strategies of quicksand and the purple and orange lines represent the single state space strategies. Um, ultimately, at the 10 hour limit on the far right, we see that both strategies of quicksand outperform both strategies of uh, single state space testing. Um, as we look uh, towards the left, however, um, towards the shorter running tests around the 100 to 200 second mark, uh, we see that we get outperformed a little bit. But this is actually attributable to the parallelization overhead that results from quicksand. Uh, quicksand is running on across 10 CPUs with a one hour time limit, whereas the single state space strategy is inherently serial, so we're running it on one CPU with a 10 hour limit. So on this next graph, um, 
I've instead adjusted the CPU time to be wall clock time. Uh, and this is just to magnify the effect of that parallelization overhead. We see now that for any fixed CPU budget you could choose, we outperform single state space uh, testing if you give us a 10 CPU allocation to parallelize ourselves. Uh, and the dashed vertical line indicates the one hour wall clock time limit that QuickSand has, beyond which, of course, we don't find any additional bugs because we've timed out. Finally, um, on this last graph, I'm showing the total verifications that we provide. The axes are the same as before, uh, but now instead of counting bugs, we're counting how many tests we reach the end of that maximal state space without finding any bugs. And we see that we thoroughly outperform single state space testing, uh, both strategies again versus both strategies. Now one note uh, that I want to point out for the uh, preempting on synchronization strategy, uh, that's the purple line, is that I've artificially penalized it because it's not actually capable of verifying tests uh, with data race candidates. At best, it can report the data race candidates, but the preemption strategy precludes preempting on those. So the purple line includes only those tests which it both completed and found no data race candidates on. Nevertheless, the preempt everywhere strategy is of course capable of finding those data race bugs because it's preempting on every shared memory access. And even so, the overhead of managing all those preemption points um, simply limits it to uh, only finding 30 to 40 uh, uh, verifications in the end. M meanwhile, we find 120 to 160 plus verifications depending on which happens before strategy we choose. Okay, so the takeaway of all this is that uh, quicksand with iterative deepening outperforms single state space model checking after 10 CPU hours in all cases no matter which strategy you choose to compare against each other. We find up to 25% more bugs uh, compared to the best single state space strategy and we provide 3x to 4x as many total verifications uh, using our convergence theorem. Uh, the preempt everywhere strategy is the best bug finding approach for single state space testing but the computational overhead of managing all those preemption points often in the thousands uh, for each execution of the test significantly impacts its ability to complete the test. Um, Finally, the comparison between the two happens before strategies indicates a trade-off, whereas pure happens before is better at providing total verifications, whereas limited happens before sacrifices completion time a little bit uh, to provide the benefit of finding bugs faster. That's all I've got. I'd like to thank you for your attention and open the floor to questions.